this morning, which we find in Genesis chapter 37, and reading verses 1 to 11. And you've got that on your sheet. <clears throat> this is God's word. <clears throat> Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. And this is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his fathers rebuked him. His father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Amen. Thanks be to God for this portion of his word. Let us join in prayer. Let's pray. Lord well, Heavenly Father, we thank you, as always, for your word, for all that it contains, for all that it teaches us, for the truth that is there, the truth that's there for us to read, to understand, and to believe, and then to put into practice. And Father, there is, of course, so much truth in your word. So much that we learn over the years, and much that we forget, and much that we need reminded of. So, Father, we pray that as we begin to look at this familiar story of Joseph, that you would help us in our understanding of the truth that is there for us to believe, and help us to take the practical points that you bring to us, and put them into practice in our lives, as we ask all this in Jesus our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we come now to one of the most well-known Old Testament characters, and we're thinking about the text uh, from Hebrews chapter uh, 11 and 22, as we're looking at the, Hebrews of, the heroes of the faith. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his Bones. And so this is one of the, the most well-known of the Old Testament characters, Joseph. And as well as a, a story of strong spiritual morals and important lessons, it has been, of course, popularized in the stage show Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. The show has been performed over well over 50 years in the United States. Kingdom and in the United States of America, including a long-standing run uh, at London's West End. And uh, some of you may have, have seen the show, I'm tempted to ask for a show of hands here, but uh, I imagine some of you have at least uh, seen it. And even our own Andrew Horn has performed in it locally, uh, as indeed there have been countless amateur productions uh, over the years. However, as with all biblically inspired 
shows and movies and so on, we have to make sure that we take our facts from the Bible, recognizing that when it comes to the entertainment industry, there is something called um, artistic license, and you certainly find that in all sorts of uh, shows and what have you. For example, in, uh, in the, the musical of Joseph and his amazing Technicolor Dream Court, there is no biblical reference or even suggestion that Joseph's brothers joyously celebrated after they told their father um, about Joseph's apparent death when he'd been taken away uh, in, in captivity. And the show certainly uh, does that, but the Bible doesn't indicate that. It's just to make the point that we've got to be careful when we, we watch uh, movies on biblical stories or biblical characters. There's always going to be a bit of artistic license there. So make sure that you read the Bible account to get the truth. Well, our text in Hebrews uh, 11 and 22 takes us near to the end of Joseph's life. Now here I need to make a, an apology from last week where I specified that Jacob lived for 110 years when in fact he lived for 147 or 148 years. I gave you Joseph's lifespan by mistake. I mixed up uh, Joseph with Jacob. But nobody picked me up on that so <laughs> you need to check what I'm saying is the truth. That's why you need to Check your Bibles and everything. Well, because Joseph is such an important biblical character, I want to spend a bit more time, a bit more in-depth look at his life in order to understand his faith and the significance of this uh, reference in Hebrews. Well, thinking firstly this morning about the favoured son. Now, we saw last time the, the complicated process of childbearing that Jacob had to go through before Joseph was born, the firstborn to Rachel, uh, the wife that he loved. And as a result, we read there uh, in, in, our, in, uh, in Genesis 37 that Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had born to him, been born to him in his old age. He had to wait a long time and there's 11 siblings before he was born. Now Israel, of course, was the new God-appointed name that was given to Jacob. Now it's understandable that Israel loved Joseph more simply because of the length of time that he had to wait for the wife that he loved to give birth, because up to that point she had been uh, unable to bear a child. But as we noted a couple of weeks ago, there's a danger in favoritism. Now, if Joseph had been the only son, then that's not a problem. But for Joseph, he was one of 13 siblings, including Dinah, his sister. And as an expression towards his favoured son, Israel made a richly ornamented robe for him, there in verse 3. Now in those days, everyone had a robe or a cloak. It was used to keep you warm, for bundling up possessions for a journey, uh, something to sit on, um, something to wrap a baby in, as well as security for a loan. And normally they would be knee-length, short-sleeved and plain. But the robe that was made for Joseph was richly ornamented, or many coloured. The, the word in the original is a bit ambiguous as to what exactly uh, it meant. So the question is, why did Israel do this? Surely he would have realised that this was going to create issues with Joseph's brothers. Well, to mark out a robe in the way that uh, we're talking about here was typically a sign that the father intended the wearer to be the future leader of the household. And this, of course, was, in a sense, Israel's intention. But there were ten older brothers before Joseph. Well, whatever was in, Is whatever was in Israel's mind, the effect on the other sons was that they hated Joseph. 
That's a strong word. They hated Joseph. And they could not speak a kind word to him. And in view of the later events, this is a serious warning about favoritism. And we need to think very carefully and wisely about how we speak to family members or in gifts we might give to them or things that we might do for them so as not to give the impression that we're favouring one over the other. And it's something that I imagine all of us have, to some extent have faced. Cindy and I at times find it difficult with our children, with our grandchildren, to make sure that in whatever we say, whatever we do, they know that we love them all equally. The favourite son. The second thing is that of the, the gifted son, Joseph. Now what we are seeing in exploring these uh, important biblical characters time and again is that God works out his purposes with flawed individuals. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they, they all made their mistakes as we've seen, but still God's will prevailed. And having said that, the faith of the individuals grew as they learned and as they obeyed God, discovering what his will was and doing what and going where he was leading uh, them. And it's a reminder to us that no matter our past mistakes, God does not abandon those who put their trust in him. Well, things went from bad to worse with Joseph when he shared the two dreams that are recorded here in our text. Now, as we know, these dreams were prophetic. This was part of the gift that God was giving to Joseph. And it tell, it's telling us that God had his hand upon Joseph. And that's something that is specifically stated later on in the Genesis account. However, this 17-year-old shepherd boy, as he was at this point, eagerly shared his dreams with, firstly, his brothers. So there was the dream of the sheaves. And in this dream, the brothers were binding sheaves of grain when all of a sudden Joseph's sheaf stood upright and all the brothers' sheaves gathered round and bowed down to Joseph's. Well, the brothers then questioned if this meant that Joseph would rule over them, which in turn made them hate him all the more. And that's understandable. And Joseph must have recognised their increased hatred, but nevertheless, he continued to share another dream. And this is the dream of the stars. Here the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to Joseph. And this was even more compelling. And Joseph told this not only to his brothers, but to his father as well, to which Israel responded with a rebuke and said, in verse 10, Will your mother and I, your brothers, actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Well, we're not told what young Joseph was thinking, but his brothers were jealous of him. Hatred and jealousy. And they didn't handle that rightly, as we'll see later. Israel, on the other hand, kept the matter in mind, it says in verse 11. And that, I think, was quite wise. I think Israel, by this time, and his understanding of the will of God, realized there was something going on here that he didn't understand. So he just kept things in his mind. And surely in the midst of any errors of judgment, Israel knew that the Abrahamic blessing was going to fall on Joseph, and he was prepared to wait and see how things developed. We talked a little bit about patience last week, and you know, sometimes as Christians we have to just wait and see. We pray for things and nothing happens, but maybe God's answer is that we just to wait and see to wait for God's time for whatever to come about. But nothing could have prepared Israel for what was going to happen soon. And we'll look at that 
next time. So, the question is, what can we learn from, um, from what can we learn from Joseph here when there doesn't seem to be much evidence on his part of faith? Here is a youngster, overconfident and self-assured, no doubt encouraged by being his father's favoured son, and increasingly alienating himself from his brothers. How could this flawed individual become so vital in the purpose of God for his people? Well, we all need to recognise this fact that we are all and always a work in progress. God is not finished with us, however flawed we are. We've already seen how God used the patriarchs and, and their flaws, and how, in Jacob's case, particularly, his faith developed over the years. Now, if you look at a diamond ring, and ladies, you probably, especially those of you who've been married, uh, will have had a nice, nice large diamond rock as an engagement ring. Well, maybe if you haven't, um, you know what they look like. But the thing is that they didn't always look like that. The stone did not always look like that. Here's a, a rough diamond, okay? And a rough diamond has to go through a complex five-step process to the finished product. Firstly, the shape of the finished stone has to be planned and mapped out, which they do nowadays on computers. Then splitting, sawing, and rounding off all the roughness, all of which has to be done with diamond-bladed uh, diamond bladed tools because diamonds are the hardest material in the world and only diamonds can only be cut by, with diamonds. And then comes the polishing stage and the forming of the many facets after which they've inspected and go through the quality control and everything until you get a final sparkling diamond. So all of us, the point is that all of us are just like rough diamonds. All the flaws and the imperfections have to be carefully chipped away over the years and polished, all according to the ordained plan for each one of us in the setting of God's overall sovereign plan. And clearly that will take a lifetime, and indeed the finished product in each one of us will only appear after the resurrection and our glorification. This then will mean that the Christian life is firstly one of yielding our lives to the finishing work of the Holy Spirit, the process of holiness. And it will necessarily mean facing and going through all manner of difficulties, hardships and pain as God works out his purposes in us. And so that means that we need to learn to stop looking at our problems or our difficulties and our hardships in a purely negative light, which we so often do. But to positively remind ourselves that God is at work in us. It's, it, I'm sure all of us do varying degrees of experience this. I certainly do. The older I get, the more frustrated I get at times when things don't go right. And Cindy will tell you that I get angry. You might not think I get angry, but I do. I get really frustrated when things just don't work. And in this world of technology, well, you know. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 28, we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. That's the key. Those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So, as, um, as we will see in looking at the life of Joseph over the next few weeks, God used the character and the qualities of Joseph's life even those bad qualities, if you like, or the negative qualities, to bring him to the position of influence that he came to that was so vital 
for the unfolding plan of God for his people. So here's a task for this week. Take time to read through the story of Joseph. You've got about 13, 14, 15 chapters from 37 through to the end of the book. And as you do so, note both the negative and the positive aspects and how they were all used to bring about God's intended purpose. You've got, of course, to read the whole story to find out what that was. But also, take time, and this is something we should do regularly, take time to review your own Christian life, to note how God used you, the various challenges and difficulties that you faced, and to give him praise for all his work in and through you over the years. Well, may God encourage and strengthen you in your faith through each day of your life. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, our Creator and Saviour, we praise you for your eternal purpose. There is much we do not and could not understand about your plan, but we know that your sovereign purposes are being worked out. It's amazing to us that you have chosen us to be a part of your plan. So help us to show our appreciation of and dedication to that privilege through living by faith each day. Thank you that we are seeing from the lives of the patriarchs that you use that you use us as we are, and you change us as we follow you in faith. As we see the flaws in ourselves, we are conscious of a world flawed in so many different ways on account of selfishness, greed, and lust for power. We pray that the transformation you bring about through obedient faith in Christians will shine a light into our world that others may see Jesus and turn in faith to him. We continue to remember the ongoing pandemic and the devastating effects upon so many. We pray particularly for countries where the virus is hitting hard, like India present. Have mercy on the country and help the situation to be contained and that all medical teams will be able to cope. We thank you that in the UK vaccinations are proceeding at a good pace and we pray that this will be a powerful defence against catching and spreading the virus. As always, we thank you for the NHS staff who have been, who've had a relentless year coping. May their health be preserved and strengthened. We pray for healing to all those suffering, whether in hospital or in isolation. For those suffering post-COVID effects, bring relief quickly. And for the grieving, bring comfort, strength and hope. And for us as your people, keep us faithful and true to your word. In Jesus' glorious name we pray.